Hey, my name is Luis Dil Santos, and I'm here to talk about how we implemented multicast with eBPF and Cilium. First, uh, who am I, right? Uh, I'm a data path engineer at Cisco. Uh, we were isovalent before Cisco acquired us. I focus on Linux kernel networking and eBPF. I've worked in open source for quite some time now. And on my free time, I like to develop NeoVim plugins and play around with Linux desktop development like uh, Wayland and GTK4 stuff. Okay, so what are we gonna cover in this talk? We're gonna do a really gentle uh, introduction to multicast, and I'm gonna go over how we implemented multicast using EPPF and the Cilium data path. It's gonna be a super nerdy talk, so you can go ahead and follow it, uh, our BPF code at this link if you want to. Okay, a couple disclaimers before we start. I wouldn't necessarily consider myself a multicast expert. I got pretty acquainted to it with uh, this project, but some of the larger multicast deployments out there, um, just guard your questions as far as how deep you wanna go uh, at the end. We're gonna talk about multicast in the context of Kubernetes and Cilium. So any kind of sources or subscribers to multicast groups outside of the cluster are a little bit of, uh, out of scope for this talk. And again, we're gonna focus on the eBPF data path, right? All right, so what is multicast, right? Uh, it was introduced in RFC 1112. It's a layer three technology, right? So it works at the IP layer. Any kind of layers on top, uh, any protocols on top are usually connectionless. It's very common to see multicast and UDP working together. And multicast is the unicast delivery to a group of hosts done efficiently, right? It removes the burden from the source. So if you look at that diagram right there, you don't see the source on the left sending packets to each uh, subscriber. Instead, the IP infrastructure in the middle is doing that work for you. So where is multicast used? Broadcasting and media streaming, right? Your favorite movie, sometimes it's being delivered to millions of clients at a time. In financial services, it's pretty popular. Uh, market update data is usually like broadcasted out to a bunch of subscribers. And online gaming is another one where you might have a session with a bunch of online gamers and you wanna broadcast the game state to everyone. All right, so how does it work? Uh, the first thing we should talk about is uh, multicast group addresses. These are just IP addresses, right? Uh, they're class D addresses. There are some specific ones here that you might want to glance at. And uh, when a traffic is sent to these groups, the IP infrastructure goes ahead and replicates those packets and sends them to anyone that's in the group. So that begs the question, how do these hosts get into this group and leave these groups, right? So we need a concept of group management, and the IGMP protocol does this for us, right? It means Internet Group Management Protocol. It's the workhorse protocol of multicast. It implements the leaving and joining of groups from hosts, and it also allows routers and IP uh, infrastructure to query who is in a group. It's a layer three protocol with the protocol number two, and there are two major objects that are uh, always referred to. Um, membership reports, this is how a host says, hey, I'm part of this group, and membership queries. This is how the IP infrastructure says, hey, who is in this group? There's three versions of multicast. IGMP v1 is, for the most part, deprecated as far as I can tell. It's really that core implementation of everything we just said on the previous slide. IGMP v2 was introduced in RFC 2236 and it adds the ability for um, group-specific membership queries. So this is uh, the IP infrastructure can say, okay, only tell me who's in this specific group. And a leave message was added as well for, you, for a host to quickly leave a multicast group. IGMP3 uh, was introduced in RFC 3376, and it adds source filtering. Now there's a little asterisk there, right? That's because Cilium does not support source filtering, and that's gonna play a role in a little bit when we talk about IGMP parsing. Okay, so what does it look like on the wire, right? IGMP v1 is a very simple protocol, right? You have eight bytes 
Uh, this is the kernel representation, which we're going to use in our eBPF code. You only have two type codes. You have the query and the report. And the way this works is that when, a, um, when the IP infrastructure sends a query, the hosts respond with a report. Also, from the RFC, uh, anytime a multicast application is instantiated on the host, it must send a membership report to say, hey, I just joined this, right? The code is unused, and the group is the multicast group address. IGMPv2 keeps the format almost exactly the same. We just add some new type codes here. Type codes OX11 and OX12 are there for compatibility. They're just saying, OK, we're going to use the formats from IGMPv1. Uh, OX16 is a new membership report v2. And uh, 17 is that leave um, message, which I went over earlier. It's just a way for a host to quickly leave uh, a group. So now with the membership v2, this code uh, field is now actually used. And it allows, uh, when the IP infrastructure makes a query, it can set a maximum time for hosts to respond. And this is to avoid uh, thundering herd issues, right? You might not want all these uh, membership reports coming back all at the same time. That maximum time allows the clients to pick a variable uh, period where it can actually send as long as it doesn't go over the threshold. And group stays the same. OK, so very simple so far, right? So IGMP3 mixes things up a bit. Uh, now we actually change this into a variable sized protocol. And the way this works is it adds a new type code. OX22 is a new membership report format, right? If you notice that the report is actually the same size other than a variable array at the bottom. So when we actually see OX22 come in, we say, OK, this is no longer IGMP header. We literally just cast it into the IGMP v3 report. And now you have this substructure called a group record. Let's dive into that, right? This is how they actually implement source filtering. So if we look at the group uh, record fields. You have type, which gives us a way to interpret the list of sources all the way at the last field. Aux words is not used. Oh, sorry. Is not used. Number of sources tells us the bound of that final um, field, sources. MCA now holds the group. Um, the multicast group address. And source is now a list of sources that should be filtered. Like I said, Cilium does not support this, so we're not going to dig into that too much. But this is how uh, this is just your knowledge when we go into actually parsing IGMPv3 and why does it become more complicated, right? All right, so let's put IGMP into action, right? What, how does this thing even work? Well, there's IGMP snooping by the IP infrastructure. So you have a router in the middle here, and he's snooping IGMP messages going back and forth. And when he sees IGMP reports, he adds these, uh, these messages to his state table, right? So an IGMP is going to be an IPv4 packet, and the source is going to be the sender. So now we can say, OK, the group address that's in the IGMP uh, membership report and the source of the packet is now part of that group it's requesting to be in. Now we have packet replication, right? So the IP infrastructure already built its little state table by sniffing out all the membership reports. Now we have a source on the left who wants to send to that uh, group of 224.0.10.0. Because we have this state table built up, the IP infrastructure can go ahead, replicate those packets, and send a copy to each person in that group, right? All right, that was a super gentle introduction. It's obviously more complex than that, but it's an mm, intermediate talk, so we'll start there. All right, so now let's talk about how do we go and take those steps and translate this into the eBPF world with the Cilium data path, right? So what I want to quickly go over is like 10,000-foot view of like what does a Cilium node even look like. So this is probably as simplified as I can explain what a Kubernetes node with Cilium uh, looks like, right? You have a pod, and you have the host. In, there's a virtual interface that bridges the two, and Cilium's going to attach eBPF to the host side vth, right? 
And that's where we can go ahead and hook in all that beautiful cilium magic, right? Um, also, we do the same thing for egress devices. So that's your native devices, right? Your actual real NICs, maybe, uh, that go out to the LAN. We also put eBPF there. And from eBPF, there's like two pretty common operations that we do. We can either redirect you to another interface, or we can just drop you to the stack and let Linux kernel handle you, right? Cool. So this is a logical representation of what we want to accomplish with multicast Cilium and eBPF, right? So when a pod sends to a group, we have these hook points right at the pods, uh, the host side VETH, where we can hook in some logic. We want to check out, uh, is it a multicast destination? If it is, then we want to do local delivery, right? Because some of our subscribers might be on the same host. And we also want to do remote delivery because some of our subscribers might be on a remote host, right? All right, so what are the puzzle pieces that we're playing here with? Like, what do we need to implement in eBPF? So we have group management. We have the packet replication, local multicast delivery, and remote uh, multicast delivery, right? These are the things that we need to pay attention to as we implement them in eBPF. So group management, we need some concept of that state table, right? We have to like store this state somehow. Well, eBPF has maps, right? Maps are just in-kernel data structures. They're created in user space. There are some general type maps, which are hashes and arrays. Then we have some specific maps, which are nested maps, and there's a little asterisk there, maybe a little bit of foreshadowing. Uh, there's LPM maps, which are longest prefix batch, program maps, which hold other BPF programs, and there's a ton of these, right? And maps provide us state between eBPF invocations, right? Maybe you don't need user space. Maybe you just want to have a map to store around some data between your eBPF hooks. And they also allow us to talk to and communicate with user space, right? This map allows user space to go ahead and actually interact with our eBPF programs. All right, so conceptually, like, what is the data model that we need? We want to be able to look up a group and then get a list of subscribers, right? And what is the best fit map type for that? It actually winds up being a nested map, right? Nested map structures are outer maps and inner maps. And when you look up on the outer map, you get back a map, right? So this winded up working very well for us because we can go ahead and do a lookup on the multicast address, and get back a hash map, which has all the subscribers, which is keyed by their source address. So this is the map definition. It looks pretty busy, right? And it is. You're not going crazy. But when we let's start all the way at the bottom there. This is actually how you define a nested map. The outer map has a type, right? That's our hash of maps. Then our key type is just a 32-bit integer, right? Because that's exactly what a multicast group address is, right? It's just a 32-bit int. Uh, the pinning stuff you can ignore. Even value you can kind of ignore, because to define a nested map, we actually use this new values field all the way at the bottom. And then that defines the structure of the inner map, right? Now, the structure of the inner map is keyed by another 32-bit address, which is just the IPv4 unicast address for the subscriber, right? And a value size of the uh, MCAS subscriber v4 structure, right? So we're going to map subscribers' source IPs to a metadata structure, which is going to help us actually do replication and delivery, right? So inside that metadata structure, we have the source address, right? It matches the key. We have the IF index. This is the interface that you want to redirect to to get that multi-class packet closer to the destination, right? We have some padding, because you need padding, or else you're going to be in a bunch of pain later. And then we have flags, which are going to tell us, is this a remote subscriber, or is this a local subscriber, right? All right, now we need to think about how do we do IGMP snooping in eBPF, right? Well, we have, you already are acquainted with our map structure. But just as a review, for IGMP snooping, what do we want to do? When we see a membership request, which is telling us to do a join. We want to look up the group address, get the subscriber map, and just add the subscriber to the map, right? Pretty simple. This is like CRUD. Uh, same thing on leave, right? When we want to leave, we do the same thing. We get the subscriber map, and then we just remove that subscriber. 
So where do we want to snoop? So I hope you remember that super simple diagram that I uh, showed you before. Uh, we're going to snoop right at the, pod, uh, the host side vth, right? All traffic leaving the pod is going to end up there. So when multicast traffic is sent, that's the perfect place to watch for it, right? It's the first place we can. All right, so let's go into the technical details of how you would do the snooping, right? This is the fun stuff if you ask me. I don't know if you think it is. Uh, but basically, the first thing we want to do is identify that we have IGMP traffic. Now, this first function at the top, the Cilium data pass gives us an IPv4 header pretty early to play with. So super simple, right? We're just going to look up the protocol. We're going to see if it's IGMP. IGMP is an IP uh, layer technology, right? So it's directly in the protocol, uh, I'm sorry, the IP header. From there, things get a little bit more interesting. So you saw that all IGMP header um, structures basically had a type, right? So we want to go ahead and take out that type to figure out what are we going to even parse. So the first thing we do here is we go ahead and we create a pointer to an IGMP header, right? Next, we're going to compute the, the uh, length of the IPv4 header. And now this little section here, right, right? This is uh, pretty important. What this is doing is if you ever heard about the eBPF verifier, we need to prove to the verifier that if we go ahead and we touch any data pointers, which this is actually the, uh, the actual bits of your packet, right? This is what's on the wire that we received. If we touch any of those, we need to prove to the verifier that we're not going to go above the bounds of that array, right? Or else that's a problem. That could crash the kernel. That could give you garbage data. And that's the verifier's uh, point, is to make sure that you don't do anything like that. So you can, the, this is like, uh, this is proving to the verifier to say, OK, if you are going to go over the uh, bounds of the data array, you're not even going to go into that next line of code, right? You're just going to drop, and you're going to go return from this function. So as long as we pass that function, then all we do is we uh, go ahead and we do actually seek that data pointer, which is our packet buffer, right? We seek it right into uh, past the IPv4 header to get to IGMP. Whoops. And then we return the type, right? Because it's an IGMP header. So after we extracted the type, now we can go ahead and figure out what version we're working with, right? Our implementation only really cares about looking for membership reports, which is a pod telling us that it wants to join a group, right? Or a leave message, which is a pod telling us it wants to leave the group. So we get the type, and then we just go into a switch case, which says, OK, like, let's match what the type uh, we found was. Now we're going to go into how would you parse IGMPv2. IGMPv2, again, simple protocol, right? So what we can do here is we can actually create our subscriber. Like I mentioned earlier, this is uh, still an IPv4 packet, right? It's just, it's just an IGMP um, packet as well. And our source of our subscriber is actually just the IPv4 source, right? Then we can set the IF index, right? Because we are snooping at the host side vth of the pod, that's the first ingress interface that the traffic comes into the host uh, networking namespace, right? So this is correct. We're, we, we get the subscriber's IF index that if we were to send traffic to it, that is its vth. It'll go right over the vth parent into the pod, right? For the most part here, this is stuff we've just discussed, right? This is all just like making the verifier happy. And then we go ahead and we get um, a pointer to our IGMP header. The IGMP header has the multicast group. And now we finally get to use our group map that we discussed before, right? We do a map lookup and get the subscriber map. And as long as we have a subscriber map, we go ahead and add the subscriber to the map, right? Pretty simple. This last part is just because this looked a little bit magic, but you can see that we're just you know, pulling out the necessary bits we need, uh, the source address, when we actually do the add there. Cool, so IGMP v3 is a bit more complex because it's a more complex protocol, right? So the way IGMP v3 works is it's now variable sized. And an IGMP v3 report has one or more group records within it, right? Each group record is going to have a type, which tells us how to interpret this, the list of sources. And that MCA field right there is going to be our multicast group address, right? Cool. 
All right, so how do we actually parse this, right? So this is, this is truncated code a bit. And you can imagine that we did all the work to already grab the IGMP header, right? But now we saw the IGMP header, and it's an OX22, meaning it's a membership report v3. And that's where we're picking up. So now that we know it's a membership report v3, we can go ahead and get the number of records in the report, right? Uh, and then we start actually looping over each item within the report. As we loop over them, we do another, we got to make the verifier happy again, right? Because now we're basically indexing into the data buffer. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And then for each record, we go ahead and we do a subscriber map lookup for the MCA field now in the record, right? So it's, it's basically the same thing as IGMP v2, other than this next part, right? Now, because we have these type fields, this is actually tells us how to interpret the source list of sources, right? Now, as I mentioned before, Cilium does not support source filtering, so we can always assume that the source array is zero. And then you have this type, which I guess is a way to kind of be extremely flexible with this protocol. But if you think about it, these types can be either changed to exclude or changed to include, right? So if we're changing to exclude zero, that's saying, give me all the multicast traffic that's coming from that group. I have no filter. On the opposite side, if you're changing to include zero, I don't want any traffic, right? There's no sources here. So it's this kind of like white deny list, white list deny list uh, that they kind of implemented in the binary protocol there. But again, we don't, like, this is as much as we care about because we're not doing too much with those sources yet. In the future, if we do support source filtering, this becomes way more relevant. OK, and then parsing leaves is very simple, right? It's most of what we talked about before as far as just getting an IGMP header. And then we go ahead and we check uh, what is the type. And as long as we find a subscriber map for the group uh, address that's in that header, then we just do a uh, removal, just like we did before. OK, so now in eBPF, we have to talk about packet replication, right? So in the kernel, it's common to hear these phrases called redirect, clone. So what is that, right? It's like an eBPF redirect. It's a way for you to inject a packet back into the Linux network stack as if it came or is going to another network interface, right? Now, clone is a way for you to copy a packet, but keep that data buffer uh, the same. So it's kind of like a lightweight clone, right? I think anyone that does Rust is like, this is embedded into your head. But uh, So we want to do both for our multicast, right? We want to duplicate a packet, and then we want to redirect it to the interface that we get for that subscriber. The th uh, the unfortunate, there, the, well, the fortunate part is that there is an eBPF helper that does this. A slight unfortunate part is that there's a typo in it that makes it sound like it doesn't do this. And I'll explain this a bit. So when you're using any kind of other redirect from eBPF, the redirection happens after the eBPF program is done, right? So you go, you go to redirect, you get back the, the exit code, and then you're supposed to finish your program. What we need to do, because we're looping, right? We need to actually do that replication and delivery multiple times within a program. And that exists. That is this helper that we have, B BPF clone redirect. But if you simply replace that word in that documentation, it becomes a much more easy to understand that that actually exists in the kernel. And it's hard to make a PR for a, for a typo fix in the kernel, right? So that's just the world we live in. And uh, if you were ever confused about if you can do this or not, and you read that, and you were like, well, maybe you can't then uh, you can. Cool. All right, so let's talk about the multicast delivery conceptually, right? Like I said, we have two types of multicast delivery we want to accomplish. We have the local case, right? So in this case, we have pod A, who's sending to a destination multicaster group. Like I mentioned before, all that traffic is going to go out to that pod facing, uh, I'm sorry, that host facing VTH interface, right? At that point, we're going to, we have EPF, eBPF, which we can hook into. 
And we're going to do, uh, we're going to make sure that it's IGMP, right? Then we're going to do a subscriber lookup in our map. And then we're going to do a clone and redirect to the interface, right? It's a local pod. So that interface is going to just be another virtual interface on our host networking namespace, right? Uh, that will go ahead and it will go to that host facing, uh, I'm sorry, the pod facing VETH, and then go over into pod B and then ultimately be delivered to your multicast application uh, in the pod namespace. Okay. So now we have uh, remote multicast delivery, right? Uh, this is essentially the same. However, you can't exactly route multicast without a multicast daemon. And this is one of the nice things that we did in Cilium. You don't need it, right? We're doing this all in eBPF. So how do you go ahead and route the multicast across nodes? Well, we're going to use VXLAN, right? Everything in networking can be solved by encapsulation. I'm pretty, I'm pretty convinced. So we're going to encapsulate it in VXLAN, send it over. And then from there, it's just local delivery, right? Pretty simple. OK, so now let's look at what that means in the code, right? What does the eBPF code look like? Well, like I said, we want to identify that it is multicast traffic rip that macro right from the kernel, right? All it's doing is checking that it's a class D address, right? It's as simple as that. If it is, then we do an eBPF tail call. Uh, tail call, if you're not familiar, is just a way to kind of jump to another eBPF program. You actually trash the stack, so you can never return to where you were, uh, but it allows you to like jump to a whole new uh, BPF program uh, as if it's a fresh context, right? Okay, uh, then this is, um, I would kind of describe this as like the setup for iterating over the subscriber map, right? So when we get here, right, uh, this little bit here is kind of interesting. This little bit here, we're setting up uh, some state which we're going to give to an iterator. We're setting it up on the stack, right? So we have a little stack pointer here, which we will eventually pass to the iterator here. Uh, but before that, we actually have to rewrite our Mac. Uh, I didn't dig into that too much, but when you're delivering multicast traffic, layer two, there's like a, a specific Mac encoding. It's in the RFC if you're, if you're so inclined to check it out. Uh, but we do have to rewrite the Mac address, um, and it's encoded via bits of the IPv4 destination address. Um, yeah, so after we rewrite um, the Mac, then we go ahead and we start using this other helper called for each map LM, which will iterate over a map and allow you to run a callback for every item that is in the map. If you're confused about what's in the map, it's that subscriber metadata structure that we went over before, right? Source address, IF index, flags, this, this stuff. All right, so this looks way busier and, and intimidating than it is, but it's actually extremely simple. So all we're doing here for each subscriber, right? We do this from overlay check, which I'll explain in a minute. But after that, we want to go ahead and we want to say, OK, is it a remote subscriber? If it is, we need to set up tunnel keys. Tunnel keys are a way for you to configure your encapsulation before you send it off to the VXLAN driver, right? I believe it's called metadata mode. When, when the VXLAN device is in metadata mode, it actually expects all the information to, to do the encapsulation in those tunnel keys. So you'll have to set that up before we do the redirect. If you weren't a remote, subscriber, then very simple, right? We just get the subscriber, we find the IF index, and we do a clone and redirect. At that point, we took the packet that we have uh, in context, we made a copy of it, and we send that copy off as a redirect to the pod uh, interface, right? Or the VXLAN interface if it's remote delivery. Now, the from overlay bit, right? So you can think about this. If you're coming from the overlay, that means some other host sent you for remote delivery, right? That other host then also sent multicast packets to all the other remotes. If we were to go and send packets to the remote, we would just loop, right? Everyone, all the remotes would be sending to all the remotes all the time. So that's why that little check is there. All right, cool. So that sums it up for me. I have some other uh, links here if you're interested. The documentation, let's say you want to go and play around with multicast, feel free. There's some documentation there. And if you are like, OK, that looked pretty cool. I want to write eBPF code. That is the code. And maybe having this in your head now and looking at the code gets you a little bit more acquainted to playing around with stuff.
Cool. That's it. About questions. <laughs> Whoops. Hi there. I have a question. Um, <clears throat> say we have an application that currently does multicast that we can go and put in a container. Is it just um, drop in to a cluster that's using Celium and it'll work? Or is there things you have to enable to get that to? Yeah, you might have to restart your app. But other than okay. that, <laughs> that's about it. If you notice, we never talked about queries, right? So because we're doing this all in eBPF, we just kind of hopped over the need to say, like, do we need a daemon piece that's going to send queries for us? But instead, OK, maybe you can restart your app. Because we need that join. We need that IGMP membership request. Mm -hmm. The RFC says any application that's starting must send that. So as long as your application is compliant and you restart it, it'll just work. OK. And I have one other quick one, real quick. Um, if your application dies and it doesn't send the leave request, does that get handled? or? Uh, that's a good question. At this time, I don't believe that would happen. Yeah. Like I said, this is very beta, so it's not completely fleshed out. Uh, but the leave request would have to happen gracefully right now. OK. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Hi. Oh, I'm sorry. Go on. All right. So I had three questions. So if I do if config, um, ether, if con the Linux command if config, For sure. Ethernet um, interface enable multicast. What's the difference between a standard command like that versus doing the multicast via eBPF? Well, to implement multicast, you kind of need a multicast daemon. And yeah, the idea is that a lot of people didn't want to do that, right? Sure, you can have multicast locally. But then if you want to start routing your multicast and doing it mm, cross cluster, then you need to add the multicast routing daemon. It has to hold open a net link socket and keep those routes alive. So it's I think the entire goal here was to kind of like make it extremely dumb so you don't have to think too much about okay. it and just turn it on and it works, right? So, you, so the, the goal is to not make you think about how am I going to configure those interfaces? Why am I going to do this daemon on the node just to get multicast, this type of stuff? OK. So the next question is um, putting myself into a distributed database situation where a node communicates or node or pod communicates to a set of other uh, parts within that particular cluster, right? So in this particular case, um, it's all TCP communication, right? But multicast is UDP, I believe, right? So how does mm, eBPF enabling in, in the distributed database, for example, Cassandra, how does that come into play or where does it intersect? Yeah, so I don't really know too much about using multicast with TCP. And I don't think it's really done too often. Uh -huh. So that almost seems to me like maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me like an application issue, not so much of a Cilium issue, because Cilium is expecting just the multicast protocol. Right, right. I'm yeah. saying uh, I enabled eBPF and Cilium multicast in my cluster. Mm -hmm. Right. On top of the cluster, my uh, man, um, the application is, in this case, is a distributed computing or distributed databases, which okay. only wants to communicate to a certain parts, right? So if I have that, how does the CLM, a layer below, knows not to do multicast for certain things? That's my question. See what I say? Well, we're only going to do multicast things for multicast addresses, right? So if the pod is sending to a multicast group, like that group host, like a class D uh, address, then yeah, we're going to do multicast stuff. But that's all we're going to do multicast for. All right, you know. Thank you. My final question. Uh, Cilium is an uh, option right, to enable this whole multicast eBPF. Uh, I know Intel has got their own CNIs. Is there any other things for, um, in the industry equivalent of this, right? Multus CNI, Cilium CNI. What other tools are like this? Is there for, for us to enable the eBPF specifically? Well, I, I don't think any cloud CNIs will do this. It's possible maybe like a flannel or a calico has this, but I don't honestly know. Yeah. You might have to do a little research there. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I had a quick question about the uh, replication. Um, uh, in the example you used, you guys did a for, a for loop over the, uh, the map itself. Is there any uh, performance or difference in function from using the broadcast flag on, on, a, on a straight redirect map call? 
the broadcast flab on a, well, so I'm maybe uh, incorrect here, but we had to use clone and redirect to do that redirection uh, during the loop, right? This broadcast flag exists for that? It does exist for clone and redirect. If you pass in the broadcast flag, it redirects it to all members of the map. Oh, interesting. Well, I just did not know about that, so mm, that's some learning for me. Maybe I'll take a look at that. And second, have you, do, you, do you guys have any published performance numbers on uh, latency increases or like between like, like the ratio for the number of replications versus like difference jitter, things there, like that yet? There has been. I'm not sure if I have them in my purview, uh, but if you would like to maybe leave an email or something like that, we definitely have those numbers, but more from like, you know, like our sales engineers and this type of stuff, right? I don't know if I have those numbers per se. All right, thank you. Yeah, for sure. Um, quick one, how does the set of multicast subscribers for a given group propagate across the cluster? Do you just propagate so, the join message everywhere? Or? So, so at this time, it's a manual configuration. Right, okay. Yeah, and that's where if you go to that document, oh, my bad. Well, I don't know if it's still up or not, but that documentation page will kind of describe that a little bit about how you might want to do that. So right now, it's, like you said, uh, like I mentioned, it's still kind of like a beta thing. And we do kind of like rely on maybe like scripts to do this for us, right? Okay, cool. Cool. We didn't want to package up the scripts. <laughs> hey, uh, quick question. Any plans for V6 support? I mean, I don't know how uh, multicast works on V6 because there's no class D addresses there. No. Okay. <laughs> well, just for now, you know, I just haven't looked at it. But if okay. it's one of those things where like, I don't know, if an issue comes up and there's like 10,000 uh, thumbs up, then it'll probably start being looked at. But as far as I know, I don't know many people doing multicast with IPv6, or if there might be just an alternative for multicast baked into IPv6, I'm not really sure. Yeah, you have to use MLD instead of IGMP, different protocol. Yeah, yep, yep, IGMP is no good there. <laughs> and I think, I think it's the other way around. Uh, there is no broadcast in V6, if I'm mistaken, it's all multicast. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so uh, one question. Um, are you doing anything with north-south traffic out in and out of the cluster, or is this just multicast inside the cluster for now? Just inside the cluster for now. Okay. Do you, yeah. do you have any long-range plans there? Or? Um, I haven't heard anything. Yeah, so I'm not completely sure. Um, yeah. What's up? We accept PRs. <laughs> we accept PRs. That, okay. That's Joe, by the way. He works with me. Cool. He's not just some random guy. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. That's it? All right, well thanks.